Carmen, welcome back. Um, I want to let all those who are listening know that we had such a fun, delicious, deep conversation last time that once we ended, we picked it up again and we recorded another segment. And then even when we ended that, we realized there's a few hanging chads that we wanted to address as well with uh, chanting and Lectio. One thing that I so treasured about what you were sharing about your own practice is the way that you have brought chanting and Lectio outside of the monastery and into your own life and into your own home. And it's just a part of your rhythm of practice. And so I'm just elated that we're going to have a chance to have you share about what, what, what words, what works have really en- enlivened your soul from the mystical text that you have brought into your own songs and chants and voice as a part of your daily life. So I want to just throw it over to you to, to just share w- what text that is and um, how you bring that to the world. Well, thank you, Paul, for having me back again, because delicious is the word. It was definitely a delicious conversation. And these words are delicious. So they, they feed the soul. Mm. And I want to say that I am not naturally a calm person. I have uh, dealt with anxiety. And then when you read in the cloud of unknowing, he says in the Middle English, this work asketh a full great restfulness. You must learn what rest is. I don't know about you, but that is a daily challenge for me, learning Mm. what rest is. And one of the things he says in chapter 35 is the contemplative beginner must, however, engage in certain exercises, which are reading, reflecting, and praying. So in other words, Lexio. And he says the beginner, but I think of our mutual friend, James Finley. Mm -hmm. And Jim always says, we're all seasoned beginners. So no one outgrows Lexio, yes. I don't think. And here are two that have meant the world to me. These have been my food over the years. And I just want to thank you again for letting me bring my joy for them, you know, into our conversation. The first one is Cadman's hymn from the seventh century. And Bede, the ancient historian, brings this to us. And Cadman was a cowherd, so not a shepherd, but a cowherd. Mm. And he took care of cows and um, at a monastery, and he was uneducated and just received, according to Bede, the gift of song. And the first recorded song that we have in English is his hymn. We only have one surviving And it is this, I translated it, so I want everyone to hear first what it is. Now let us praise nature's creator, the mysteries, kind beauty, and wise mindfulness, the work of our ancestor and present guide who created the beginning of each wonder, who first shaped heaven as a roof for all the earth's children, then the holy creator, human's helper, and present friend made the middle world the solid ground for everyone. For these gifts, we praise the kind beloved. And I have sung this song in the Old English so much that when our children were young, they could sing it. Now this in Old English, now this is, (laughs) I mean, at the playground, pushing them on the swing, I would sing it some because it just came and they, and they're tuning into Everything, you know, they're just swinging. They're like two and they're just swinging. And I've sung it when I clean toilets. I've sung it when I felt grief. I mean, I've just sung it. And it and it goes like, and I want everyone to listen for the Middenyard, which is very Tolkien-esque because that's Middle Earth. You'll hear that in the middle. But this is kind of like I grew up singing, this is my father's world and to my listening ears. All nature sings around me, rings the music of the spheres. So this is kind of like the very first rendition in English of this song praising nature. And in the Old English, it goes like this. 
Nuschelon, heri jäjen, nuschelon, heri jäjen, nuschelon, heri jäjen, nuschelon, heri jäjen, hev on rich ei swajud, mej et hod och smash dig an dis moja thank, wer kulder fader, swa hej wundri och häs, et tjej drishta nå hår och hon ställ dig. He er shepeth and barnum hef unto rofa. Halik shepand. Thamid and yard moan can swear de che drishtan after her teoda. Firaham folden. Freya almishtish. Freya almishtish. Freya almishtish. And everybody may wonder, where did that tune come from? Well, hmm. since we didn't have any recording devices, no YouTube, no kind of mics or anything back in the seventh century, as I said these words in the old English, a tune just rose out of them, sort of like mist in the morning. So one of the things I love to encourage everyone to do is find a Bible verse they love hmm. or a Mary Oliver poem, like, I don't know, Wild Geese or any hmm. other one. Or another kind of nourishing, nourishing words for for you, yeah. and um, just songs come out of them. And then the prayer for the preface in the cloud of unknowing is absolutely gorgeous in the Middle English. Couldn't be more beautiful. And in modern English, it says, "God, to you all hearts are open." To you, all longing speak, and to you, no secret thing is hidden. I beg you, purify the intentions of my heart through the unspeakable gift of your grace, so I can love you with all I am and praise you for all you are. Amen. And what I love about this one is each word, it reminds me of how Simone Weil said she used to pray the Lord's Prayer in, in, in Greek and try to focus as she was picking grapes on just each word as she went along. And this one is short enough to where when I have said it in the Middle English, I can think about each word and you think about to you all hearts are open. In other words, everyone's turn into love in some way or other. To you all longing speak, that's really comforting to me that God knows my longings. We all have such deep longings. And to you no secret thing is hidden. That's been very helpful to me when I have something that I need to work out. Maybe something I've done that I wish I hadn't or something I'd like to do that I haven't mm. yet. <laughs> and I beg you, it says, purify the intentions of my heart. So in the Middle English, It's like this, God unto whom alle hertes ben open, an unto whom alle willa speketh, an unto whom no privé thing is hid, i besecheth they, so for to cleanse the untent of mine heart with the unspeakable gift of the grasa, that he may parfit lich a love they, and worthy lich praise they. Amen. And I lived with this so long. I remember going up for a speaking engagement when I lived in Georgia and I had this on a three by five card. I carry, I have, I find old pairs of jeans and they always have folded up three by five cards. <laughs> and I, I had these words on a three by five card and on the way to Chattanooga once, you know, you go up 75 for hour after hour after hour driving And I was so nervous. I can't explain, but anyone who's dealt with severe anxiety understands this sort of, um, even if it's not a full-blown panic attack, this sort of heart racing nervousness. And I literally started singing this on the way to Chattanooga. It just came into a song. Wow. And so I literally sang pretty much for hours on the way up there to give this uh, talk with, um, with Phyllis Tickle, in fact. And Probably no one who saw me give the talk knew that I was nervous, but they also didn't know that I had chanted the whole way there. And I, I find that very grounding. And so 
this opening prayer in the Middle English sung is like this. God, unto whom alle Herte span open, and unto whom alle Wille speketh, and unto whom no privé thing is hid. He beseech they so for to cleanse the intent of mean head with the unspeakable gift of the grass that he may perfect lich a love of they and were the lich praise of they amen i just love this and because my name carmen means song or poem i often think i'm singing into my selfhood but i actually think we all have this selfhood of song so I have sung these, as um, you and I have discussed before, I've sung these when I um, am grieving. I mean, these are songs that are inherently joyful and intimate, but I've sung them when I'm not um, sure about things in life. I've sung them, yes, when I'm joyful, but they fit every occasion. And I've thought often about the people that I've translated, Benedict, Alfred of Innisham, the 10th century Benedictine monk, Brother Lawrence, of course, the Clouds Anonymous, Juliana Norwich, Hildegard of Bingen, they all sang every day. Yeah. They sang the Psalms, they sang, they sang their Lexio Divinas. And so I think they really had a handle on what it means to be human. But I love your emphasis on Lexio and practice as being accessible for all of us. We don't have to be monks and nuns. And you often compare it to like brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. I compare it to flossing your teeth. And I just think singing is a daily joy we can all have and that it doesn't need to be kept just to weddings or funerals mm -hmm. or special occasions like church, you know, once a week type of things. I just think we're made to sing. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. So thank wow. you for letting me share this because I, I sing these. I, I sing something like this every every day at some point in the day. It's just part of my my walk. Well, thank you for sharing your voice and reflections uh, and song with us. It, it was really beautiful to listen to and to to hear everything that goes into that. And I had, um, while you were singing, I know folks listening can't see you, but um, do you know who Gillian Welch is, the, the musician? I don't know if you know her work at all, but her yes. and uh, Dave yeah. Rawlings, who plays guitar with her, like when they play, I have often said when I've seen them live, it's like, oh, this is what the joy of the Lord is. It's just because they're fully alive. And I had that same thought watching you sing where you could just see that you were fully present. Um, in this song, in, in this practice, just because that's, you were fully alive in the present moment. And I was just immediately flashed back to seeing them in concert um, because it, it's that same immediacy of expression of the divine flow is completely unencumbered and, um, and freeing flowly. And that, that was the experience of, uh, of just getting to bear witness to you uh, in this practice. And there's so many directions I would love to touch on with this because you have really teed this up as one, that, that first step of everyone listening, what work, what passage of scripture, what poem, what song speaks to you in a way that it could become a part of your own daily practice. And then to personalize it even further is maybe a, a tune will arise from the musing of that text that will be completely your own as a way to express this connection with the divine, with the world, with one another. And 
I love that invitation to explore those things already in your life, from your tradition, from the art that moves you, to let it be the outflow of how you practice Lectio, and that it doesn't have to be this foreign, old monastic thing. There's certainly, that's part of the tradition. And there's ways in which it can be reawakened in your own body and in your own time by what is calling to you. I can just picture you, as you said, you know, whether you're cleaning the bathroom or when you said previously pushing your kids on the swing, that that to me is the juiciness of spiritual practice, the, the not going away to do something, but the integration into daily life, the outflow of the moment, the intention, the connection. Uh, and as you said, like your kids were very well versed in these passages from Middle English because it was just a part of their daily environment. And I also just want to also touch on, you know, one thing I'm really grateful about my wife, well, there's many reasons, but w- one in particular is because singing is such a part of her family life. She uh, was born and raised in the Mennonite church. And so singing is just what you do when you get together, whether you're having a meal, whether you're grieving, celebrating, or just happen to be together. Like it's, it's a, a, a gateway to, I don't, she would probably not use these words, but it's a gateway to mystical connection. Uh, through the commonplace of singing together. And that is something that I just feel we are in dire need of in our culture today is opportunities not to just listen to others sing, but to get together and sing. Um, what are your thoughts on communal practice, uh, whether it's in a religious community or just friends getting together to sing? And also, just just to tease out further uh, your own kind of personal practice, if there's other things that that touch upon that as well. well. That's just beautiful to hear, though, about your wife's family tradition. Because when I was a student in Germany, the Bushbeck family that mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time with, mm-hmm. they would, whenever they got together as a family, they'd get around the piano, and anybody who played an instrument would bring it out. And they were just a poor... Uh, Lutheran minister's family, you know, Mm -hmm. they just Mm -hmm. had always emphasized music. And I, growing up, always sang in a choir, you know, and I just think there's such joy. I've sung in also, um, you know, just choirs in college, Mm -hmm. and there's just Mm -hmm. such joy in that communal singing. You're right. And I love the way you say it's juicy. (laughs) And I also love how you emphasize the playfulness of letting, of anyone picking a favorite poem or a favorite scripture, something that really speaks to the heart or any kind of nourishing um, text and letting any kind of tune arise. And I know we often, I did want to say one thing, you know, since you've sort of teed that up so well, that I think we often think I'm not a singer. You know, I'm a teacher. I'm not a singer. Or I know the first time I was um, in therapy when I was in Rome, Georgia, uh, the therapist said, well, you could write about these feelings. Oh, she said, oh, but you write all the time. She said, you could draw about your feet because I was like writing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like I'm a bit tired right now. And then she said, or you could draw. And I'm like, I don't draw. She said, mm-hmm. yes, you do. And so I bought a really big pad. Mm-hmm. And I got some really um, colorful, not expensive, but, you know, colorful little markers. And I drew my feelings. Mm. And when I look back on those, I think, wow. I mean, I'm not sure if um, a famous artist would go A plus, but I really don't care. (laughs) Yeah. It's like it's it was the point was to get in touch with with myself. And I think singing is the is the same. And it's a very childlike thing. That's the thing. It gets us, like you said, when you were talking about, um, you know, going to the concerts and listening to those, I think there's an immediacy 
that are, are like you said, mystical gateway, maybe your wife wouldn't call it that, but mm-hmm. there is an immediacy there in the present where we really become um, totally focused in the now. Mm-hmm. And I just think then it we're so attuned to doing things for performance. Yeah. That's just kind of like the binary way. I mean, if we want to call it empire or the binary or um, commerce, <laughs> wh- yeah. whatever we want to call it, there's this um, hierarchy of good, bad, bought, not bought, failure, success. And really being a human is to do with um, connection and relationship. And, and I, that's why I sing. I, I sing, I, I never, I, I feel it was a gift in a way because I never, when I started these singing things, it was more, it rose out of a need for my own healing. And mm. so I never thought, does this sound good? I never, I, it was more like a joy, uh, even in the midst of sometimes grief and suffering, it was still, it fed my soul. And so how I think about communal singing, I, I, I think you're right. I think we need more more spaces just to get together and mm-hmm. and sing um, from all backgrounds. And my and as for my other practices, my main my main big practice really is walking meditation. Mm-hmm. I do other forms of meditation um, like centering prayer. I do uh, pract- I practice the presence. I sometimes do centering prayer as practice the presence. So like I might take my sacred word and in 30 seconds of time, drop it in, return to that, and then go about my business. So I really think we all should experiment with what, with what works for us. But my, my main thing is walking meditation. And that can be in a city. If I'm traveling and I'm just going around the block, it can be the full on joy of walking through the marsh. And during those times, I try not to look too odd because, you know, now that I have silver (laughs) hair, I definitely fit into the, you know, um, uh, you know, silver haired person out for a walk category. (laughs) And I don't I don't want to alarm anybody, but I do sing, you know, aloud to the marsh. And if nobody's around, one of the joys of the opening of the Middle English uh, cloud Uh, preface prayer is it starts out with God. And since the tune came, God, one of the things I really love to do is see how long I can stretch it out and really think about what does Mm -hmm. that mean? Mm -hmm. So I might take a really deep breath and then live into it. And um, for a long time there, I had on my three by five card, Wild Geese by Mary Mm -hmm. Oliver. Mm -hmm. And I also had it on my phone in case I wore different pants and I didn't have it in the back pocket. And I might actually be walking through the marsh with my phone out, looking at a Mary, Ol- looking at a Mary Oliver poem, trying to say it where I think it and not read it. And yeah. if I'm thinking it, then I'm more into the words. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. And eventually I don't memorize it, but eventually it's become a part of my DNA. It really does that thing where Jesus says, you know, when the devil or the adversary, I prefer, tempted um, Jesus in the desert to turn the stones to bread. And he said, but people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of love, I like Mm. to think of it. Mm. And so to me, living with these words is like eating my greens. I just saw an article in the newspaper yesterday that said, I mean, I prefer Pringles, to be quite frank. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, sometimes Pringles, doom scrolling. I mean, you know, sometimes we have these moments where the human nature part is like, I can pop open those Pringles. But really, when we read about it, uh, you know, we really, greens are best for us. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And they're mm -hmm. tasty. And they're tasty. Um, And that's how I feel about a Mary Oliver poem. It's not Pringles. It's definitely greens. And so I can spend a long time in the marsh singing, uh, like a poem, a a song came up for the poem, Wild Geese. And, um, I just think we forget to feed ourselves. Mm. 
Yeah. And it is easy. I mean, I don't know about you, but it is easy to, um, under the guise of I'm keeping up with the news, kind of, kind of just doom scroll. Because sometimes the just keeping up with the news is doom scrolling. Do, mm-hmm. you, do you know know what I'm saying? And um, I just think Brother Lawrence was really known for his hope, and Joseph, his friend, who was you know 20 years his younger, said that the more reason there was not to hope, the more hopeless things seemed. The more Brother Lawrence hoped. And I think that's because his secret sauce, the juiciness of his life, the deliciousness of Mm -hmm. his life was because he was eating sacred words. He was eating nourishing words all the time. Mm -hmm. And that part of it was his conversations with love. Part of it was he loved the gospels. And I just think we're starving. Um, We're starving in many ways. We, We tend to either be eating Pringles or just not eating well in general. I think we we I think it's easy to forget in our world that eating is also for the soul. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that's so rich. I'm a flutter with with thoughts on this. Uh well, one thing I'll just say share first, you know, there's been as I think about the decline in religious institutions, which have been primary places for people to get together and sing as far as like mass audiences. As those numbers go down, those opportunities are being lost. And I think about the ways that laughter and singing are connected um, and how there's been a huge comedy boon, you know, more comedy than ever out in the world and ways to access it. And I, it just makes you wonder what what the this is just more of a wondering what the connection is there as opportunities for singing goes down where people are seeking laughter as a way to subsidize that lack of singing um and i think they do different things like both i think are outlets but i think singing there's a there's an intention there where laughter is more of a surprise you can't control that but i think about the way there <laughs> there was a stretch uh, I want to say five years ago where I just decided I was going to sing on my commute to work because I do, this was a time where I was alone and often it was the transitional time of from home life to work life. And what would happen if I would just dedicate that time to singing? And I would show up more joyful for work because I think that intention of connection and expression was, was happening, you know, and um, I was also have, you know, believed in that thing of like, I'm not a singer and by any, you know, performative standpoint, I'm not, but we're all singers. And it's part of the, I think the connection piece. And so to celebrate that, I think this is part of why I love poetry so much too. And take that as, um, you know, these are my vitamins I take every day. I read at least two poems a day because I build it into my schedule. Like if nothing else, I'm going to read some poetry because it needs to, to, I need to eat those greens. I need to have that, those nutrients get into my system because of the way in which I, I can't rush through a poem. I can't like speed read a poem and think I can absorb those nutrients. And so it just immediately slows me down the same way. I think uh, if I approach scripture with Lectio, um, or a good song, like I love lyrics. I think this all connects to poetry as well. Um, to sing a song that holds meaning to you, whether it's, uh, you know, a hymn or, or Bob Dylan or Joni Mitchell or whoever it might be that, that's, that speaks in resonance with your soul. It, it is so much more necessary now in times where we're fraught with the urgency of the doom scroll of knowing every, every bad thing that's going on in the world, hitting us that space for rest, that space for song just feels of the utmost importance that it's not a wasting time. It's actually allowing the integration for hope amidst the chaos and listening to those voices. And I think you are one of those voices who's calling us to that through your, the very specific translations of those who sing and um, what the messages that they are holding, you bring us right back into that. And I don't think one can translate 
those mystics without also being of that same mystical ilk who's practicing that in the context of their own daily life. So I, I just have so much gratitude for the way that you do this professionally and personally, and that there's um, the muse drips between the two. I think it's it's so what a, what a model for those of us who are seeking to live more this way. So I just thank you so much for the gift of your time and for your your willingness to share your gifts with us because I think they're going to reverberate for all those who are listening as folks start to think about, oh yeah, like what's my song? What's my poem? What's the scripture that speaks to me that I can I can eat and I can I can sing out in my bathroom, my car, or wherever it might be. I absolutely love it. Such a gift to always be with you. Thank you for listening to Contemplify. May it refresh you and be a contemplative refuge. And perhaps maybe a moment or two will walk with you along the rest of your day. You can slide over to contemplify.com to find the show notes for this episode, including links to the resources mentioned in this conversation. And while you're there, you can also sign up for the monthly Contemplify non-required reading list, which I tee up with a contemplative musing, then reflect on a few books that have come across my desk and wink at the art and articles stilling my soul. If you're enjoying Contemplify, please rate and review it on your podcast player. The internet's a huge place. This helps spread the contemplative cheer. The theme song for Contemplify is called Langside by Charles Enns and Darren Hovius. Fellas, thanks as always. For season four of Contemplify, I want to offer a nod. This is not an ad, but a nod of appreciation. This nod goes out to the Center for Spiritual Imagination. The Center for Spiritual Imagination exists to deepen and enrich human relationships with God, self, and neighbor in new and ancient ways. I can say with certainty that some of you listening, the offerings from the Center for Spiritual Imagination are exactly what you have been longing for. Check it out at spiritualimagination.org. And as always, I'm looking forward to bringing you more musings and more conversations with contemplatives in the world here in the near future. Until then, be well.